Um, it is a great honor and privilege, and real joy, to be able to share um, Ellen Ansfri's work with you in this exhibition. We, um, I just want to spend a moment to uh, introduce the panel, introduce um, Susan Vorel, a uh, respected scholar in African art, in addition to being a, a generous mentor and friend to me. She is a, um, a devotee of Elle's work. She's been following his career for many, many years and has, uh, as, as Matthew mentioned, produced a film, Full Crumpled Crush, which is a documentary of following Elle's work, um, particularly at the seminal moment in 2007 in the Venice Biennale when he made this international splash on the contemporary art scene. She's also um, produced a number of film segments that you can see within the exhibition as well, and a book, um, Eladon Street, Art and Life, um, which we will be uh, pleased to be signing after the program. So, Susan Vogel, and, and finally, the, the man who needs no introduction, whose work is really an introduction to himself, I have uh, the great pleasure of welcoming um, Ellen Atsui to the museum, and I would ask that you all join me again in welcoming Ellen. So, so the format that we, we settled on for this, this afternoon's program is, is basically a conversation. We just want to have a dialogue amongst, amongst the three of us, um, and I think we'll, we'll start with Susan. Yeah, I, it, in the galleries yesterday, um, aside from being thrilled to be with those wonderful pieces again, I was really interested to get into conversations with people who asked me questions basically about the relationship of the work to Africa, to African art, African textiles, and so on. And I found myself wondering if we knew that the artist who created those works was from Venice, we would see them related to Mosaic, we would see them related to San Marco, and to the Byzantine tradition. And if we thought the artist was from Vienna, we would think they were related to Klimt, to the great moment of Viennese glory, and so on, and to that heritage, and that the artist was expressing that. And if, the art, if we thought the artist was from Las Vegas, we would make a whole bunch of other associations. If we thought the artist was a woman, we would say, oh yes, it's pliant, it's beautiful, it's flexible, it's very feminine. So I wonder, to what extent is it legitimate, fair, appropriate to look at your work so strictly in the box of African art and African culture? Isn't there more? Uh, well, uh, maybe I'll start by uh, thanking the Brooklyn Museum for uh, giving me the opportunity to have my first museum show in New York. You know. And I uh, also thank all of you for coming. Uh, I question uh, how... To what extent... <laughs> <laughs> to what extent do you encourage or invite people to look at your work in terms of Africa, African art, and African history as opposed to the context in which it is now displayed, which is world art, international contemporary art. That is, that is the context in which you're showing. And I'm asking, it, obviously it's a balance, but where do you put the balance yourself? I don't, I don't think that that is a problem for me. And so I don't have to think about how to put a balance, you know. Thing. And what I know is that as an artist, uh, I am trying to reach out to people, no matter where they live or come from, you know. And uh, so whether it's African or Western, or you know, that just doesn't matter to me. You know, I regard myself just simply as an artist and not necessarily uh, an African artist or Ghanaian artist or any such thing, you know. And uh, I think if I should use statistics to uh, the largest number of people who have collected my work are not from Africa. 
So it means that uh, whatever it is I'm doing, it reaches out. And therefore, it's not necessarily limited to Africa. It could originate from Africa, but then it's, uh, it, it reaches out beyond Africa. That's, that, that's always what, it, what has seemed appropriate to me. It's interesting, it's always been interesting to me to look at your work in the context of the artists you were exhibiting with at the time. And you can see how radical your work is from the 60s, 70s, 80s, when you look at it alongside the artists he was exhibiting with in Nigeria and Ghana, mostly Nigeria, and then um, elsewhere, but mostly they were African artists. Um, and now, you're exhibiting in another world, you're exhibiting in international biennales, and it really seems interesting to look at the work in that context. Um, and in biennales, of course, the artists come from everywhere. So they're not coming from nowhere, they're coming with their own um, heritage and their own ideas and their own traditions. So it's, it's, it's just a really interesting kind of, I still see it as a kind of balance because it's both, I mean, you're, you're an artist, but you're, and you're making art, but you're also an African artist. You're an African man making art. Um, and that, all, all of those things, men, African, all of those things somehow go into our mix of as we try to understand the work. But Kevin, you, I'm sure you're aggressive with this as well. Oh, no, 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 sorry. And that's, I mean, that, that is something that was of particular interest to me when I was thinking charged with presenting your work as the curator of African art here. Mm -hmm. it, it was important for me in you know, thinking about your work in the context of an encyclopedic museum that connects, connects both contemporary art and African art, that we offer some way of understanding a connection to both, while also making it very clear that from the get-go, you are, as you say, an international contemporary artist, first and foremost. And then, and then from that, we can develop the, the themes and metaphors that are at play in your work. Um, but you know, from that position, what, one of the things that interests me is you know, you've had this chance to travel the world, to travel the globe, particularly the last six or seven years to see many, many different types of artists. And I'm, I'm sort of curious what artists you're interested in and following now, and if you find yourself in dialogue with any, anyone in particular. Yeah, I think uh, we'll have to start from how was I made. Thank you. you know. <laughs> yeah, I went to, well, I started life completely uh, sequestered from my own culture, living in a mission house with uh, an uncle who brought me up. He was a reverend, and so my environment was school, which is a Western thing, and church, which is also from outside. And so I didn't have any much uh, contact with my uh, local culture. You know, we were forbidden to mix with heathens, you know. <laughs> and so I didn't know much about my local culture and I lived in that kind of situation throughout high school and went to university from there. And in university, the art school was uh, affiliated to a university in London. And therefore, curriculum, everything was transplanted from, from there to, uh, to Ghana. And therefore, uh, we didn't have much contact again with because that curriculum. We didn't have much content uh, that referred to our local circumstances, you know. So it was just a few of us who, towards the end of the art school decided that there was something missing and that we needed to know something about our own visual culture or art artistic culture as well. And uh, from that point uh, we started searching and luckily for us uh, there was this uh, uh, National Cultural Center right in the same town with the university and uh, I remember I used to go there weekends to sit down and watch 
musicians, dancers, artists. You know, there were people casting uh, in bronze and uh, and uh, there were people carving as well in wood and other things, you know. And over there, there was, I saw a certain collection of, uh, of, uh, of signs or, or what I call uh, ideograms. Yeah, they are ideograms because they, they, they are not alphabets per se, but uh, they would stand for maybe a saying or an idea. You know, and uh, I was very interested in that because they, to me, were attempts to encapsulate very abstract ideas, you know, intangible ideas like the omnipotence of God or versatility or the soul. You know, such, such things. Now, uh, the reason this was very attractive to me was that uh, just before it, we had just finished looking at European Renaissance art. And anybody who knows about Renaissance art <coughs> would agree that it was something that uh, was meant for the eyes, you know, it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, something like you need the, the, the mind very much to approach. But here I was looking at very abstract concepts uh, that uh, are, try, are, are being given uh, life. And it was very attractive to me and I stayed with this uh, science, studying them, trying to understand their structure and their meaning and everything, you know, for about four or five years, you know. And that was my beginning, the beginning of my uh, career. So right at the beginning of my career, I've been grappling with uh, abstract concepts. You know, maybe that's what has made uh, my work a bit different from uh, uh, that of most, uh, you mentioned that uh, my work is different from that of some of my uh, colleagues. Yeah, maybe that might be the reason why it's uh, different from because uh, many uh, people who went to art school to would stick to the Renaissance ideal of very similitude, you know, and such things, and that. And also the materials, the medium. Yeah, yeah, and, and also the medium and everything. Uh, whereas in my case, I had this, you know, having, having been uh, uh, cut away from my own culture for a long time, I think it developed a very strong hunger in me, you know, hunger and thirst and everything, you know, for, for it. And uh, I decided that if I should carry on my career with, with that, with the art career, then I have to indigenize my ethos, you know. And right after uh, the art school, I started doing that. First of all, by looking for media that are immediately uh, available and around in my environment, you know, and then uh, processes and ideas, you know, that are sourced from there. Do you want to tell, tell them about the trays? Tell them about the trays. <laughs> the trays. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, I think the first form of, uh, of uh, sculpture, well, I don't know what you call it sculpture. Yeah, it's sculpture because it's, uh, it's three dimensional. <laughs> yeah, was that I went to the market and, 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 and saw these uh, trays, you know, wooden trays that. Uh, uh, used by the women to display their wares. And uh, I decided that these were uh, things that I should start exploring. You know, having studied the science and the ideograms from the National Cultural Center, I decided that I would use this uh, trade as my support and uh, intervene with this science in them, 
you know, normally the, the signs are printed on a funeral cloth. You know, cloth that is worn at funerals. And uh, they normally put in big clusters, you know, on this cloth. But in my uh, approach, I wanted to isolate each sign and put it in a tray and then design a border which would help to enhance its uh, meaning. You know, so, uh, and also used a very uh, low tech available uh, method of uh, deploying these things in a, in a trace. You know, like in this way of branding them with, uh, with uh, hot rod. You know, and uh, then had a strategy of also displaying them in clusters, you know, not one tree at a time, but a group of them at a time, you know, so you could change their order or their formation or whatever at any time. So many questions. One of the, I think, one of the really dominant things in your work, something you've said is really central, is process and medium. That the work is really about process and medium. And I wondered if you would like to talk a little bit about the medium of bottle tops, which is a highly unusual one. In fact, I don't think anybody else is using that medium except you. Um, about how you discovered it and why you have stayed with it for so long. Well, first of all, why did I stay with it so long? Because it still has a lot of things that it is revealing to me. You know, uh, actually, when I did the first one or two pieces, I thought it was going to be a very fairly short run. And then uh, I ran out of ideas what to do with it, but as I kept that was in 2002. Working, yeah, no, 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 no the first ones were in uh, 1999. <laughs> but but first exhibited in 2002, and uh, that uh, I saw that the potential that the material has, and uh, kept working with it, and with each uh, work, I discovered a new way of, uh, you know. Uh, manipulating it and uh, initially uh, I was thinking of just sculpture, a form that is uh, free and uh, fluid, elastic, you know, and uh, easy to manipulate and doesn't have a, a, a specific uh, form just like a Statue of Liberty, which is always uh, carrying it. You know, <laughs> but it should be able to do so many things, you know, at any time. Uh, that was uh, what I uh, started with. And uh, the medium itself, the bottle caps, drink, was introduced into well, drink that was not 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 necessarily all drinks. Drink because before Europe came to Africa, we were making our own drinks. But Europe came with uh, bottled whiskey and brandy and rum and other things, and and they had caps on them, you know, which were some of the items that they brought for uh, trade with the continent, you know. So that. Uh, the initial contact between Europe and Africa, I think, is uh, had drink there as one of the witnesses uh, of the participants, you know, and <laughs> I think these drinks were changed for so many goods and eventually uh, slaves and so many things that uh, were brought to. The slaves in particular brought to America and they produced sugar cane and other things that they make rum and send it to Europe and then it comes back to Africa again and then it's exchanged for, you know, so, so that I have a feeling that the, the drink, you know, was uh, 
a very uh, strong link between the three people or the three continents. You know? So in working with the World Cup, I just have a feeling that I'm working with something that has to do with history. You know, incidentally my work has not consciously but you know somehow made reference to the aspects of uh, the history of Africa, you know, and this is uh, just one of them. And also off into consumption, a lot of, a lot of, beginning with the, the wooden trays that he was talking about were used to display basically food, um, fruit, vegetables, things that were for sale in the market, and that's been a kind of consistent thread, isn't it? Yeah, when you talk about consumption, then uh, I look at this from so many, uh, uh, other angles, or in terms of other media that I have used, you know, there was a time I, I realized that unconsciously I've been working with, uh, with uh, media that have something to do with consumption. The trays have to do with food, and uh, then I worked with uh, a series of ceramic pieces called the broken pots, and the pots have something to do with with water and food, and uh, later on work with uh, wood again, and old wood that have been used by humans, and the, the, the commonest uh, type that I used was the mortar, and the mortar has some do with food again. And then finally, uh, the bottle caps, you know, which have, uh, and, and then milk, milk tins, and you know, and so I have a feeling that there is a, the, 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 the common line that runs through all the media that I've used so far have something to do with food or nurture. And I want to link it with uh, my uh, development and my hunger, you know, for discovering my culture, you know, in the, in, 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 in my search for satisfying my hunger for my for hunger for my culture, I've worked with uh, objects which have to do with food. <laughs> I mean, you, Ellie, you create these sculptures that are that are so densely packed with meaning that potentially they're they're abstract, but they, as you say, they reference various sort of links to your own culture, to the places you've experienced, to food. But yet, it, yet it's very important for you that they, this work adapt and change every time you install it. What, why is that so, so central a part of your practice? Yeah, I don't know, but it's also something we developed organically to the, the I can't explain, but I, I uh, bit the uh, board with, you know, the kind of school fair that you were brought up on, where you were given a, a life model, and the model has to pose in a particular way, and be able to maintain that <laughs> for, for maybe a week or so. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking, why, why, why should that be so? Why, why should an artwork be that way? And I, I have a feeling that uh, the art, artwork is a kind of a parallel of life, you know, or, or art is life itself. And art, uh, life is not something which is static, it's forever uh, changing, forever uh, in a state of flux. And uh, if that is the case, then the artwork too should be in a state of flux. So right from the trays which are display in clusters that you can change the form of, you know, to the wood slabs that were numbered, but the numbers were just initial propositions that I make. You can decide to ignore them and, and have a different sequence altogether and make something different out of what I have uh, uh, suggested. Uh, 
bottle caps, you know. Uh, I think it has something to do also with my desire to come on, invite people to also be a part of what uh, I'm giving. I, I think I give the data and they have to be able to manipulate that data and get something uh, else out. You know, and it's been a, a very uh, interesting experience, you know, especially when I watch uh, my shows travel to different venues and uh, I see some curators are kind of scared and some are there. <laughs> And I think these days, after so many times of preaching about the freedom and uh, you know that I offer them, to, some of them are picking up and uh, doing very great uh, stuff. We, I just came from uh, the University of Michigan, uh, where they have my retrospective right now, and I saw that. They were able to mount some of the work very interestingly and and uh, give them shapes that I haven't seen myself or would have thought about myself. And uh, over here too, when I passed through on my way to Michigan, I peeped in and, and saw very interesting and, and daring uh, experiments that they have made with uh, uh, the works that I uh, sent, and uh, maybe later on I'll ask you. Oh no, do what it now. <laughs> ask it now. Sure. Sure. No. I'll ask you why why you uh, displayed certain of the works ways that I haven't seen them before. Oh, and, uh, the first one would be the the one uh, on the wall, which uh, which was supposed to be at I uh, the river. Uh, river. Yes. Yeah. At, at I level, but they put it very low. Yes. You know, and when I saw it, it was very uh, exciting to me. You know. <laughs> yeah. And then the second one would be the uh, no, the, the, the glee. Uh, yes. The glee, where most of the venues that I've been to have seen it. Uh, organized horizontally, but you played with the vertical and uh, horizontal and even some diagonals and all that thing. And then I saw that you lifted most of the so-called walls off the ground and you know, if, if you can give some reasons or, or <laughs> can you <comment? laughs> you know. No, I, we, we, we were very inspired by, by your your admonition to, to curators and to, to collectors to take your work and use it to respond to the space. And that's really particularly what happened with Lee. We had this incredible 72-foot rotunda that, that is very rarely used for art. Very rarely do we have art of a scale that will actually fill that space. And so we wanted to think about how best to make use of that space. And, and we thought about you know, Lee is designed as a sort of architectural environment in which you are, you find yourself as a visitor immersed and sort of surrounded by these works. And so we wanted to really make, make full use of the drama there in that space. Um, I, I was also particularly inspired by a quote that I had I heard you give, I think at um, Rice University when Lee was first installed, about um, walls and how when you look at a wall, your eye immediately hits a barrier, but because there's a barrier, the imagination goes beyond it and looks up and looks beyond it. And so I sort of thought this idea of looking up into the space was, a, was an interesting way of relating to that idea of the wall. And as for river, that that was again thinking about the title. If river seems something like that would be low to the ground, and it'd be, the, the space was more interesting if there was a, a variance. But yeah, so I'm, happy. I'm, 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 I'm happy that I'm waking up museums. <laughs> Let's uh, switch switch uh, gears for a moment. Um, your work is constantly being compared to cloth, and in particular to kente cloth. 
your work has always been compared to cloth and to kente cloth. And I wanted to read something that you said uh, a while ago that I think is really kind of an interesting thing. I'd like to hear um, how you feel about this. You said, I made a mistake when I started naming the metal hangings after cloths because people seized upon that so that all they do is build a point up on kente cloth and then that ends everything. But the idea behind these works is that they are to be looked at as sculpture, pieces in which, in which case you have to look at all the ramifications that go into a work of sculpture, the process, the material, and so forth. Um, when I was in the gallery a couple of days ago, people were talking about Kente. Uh, and I wondered, particularly with the most recent pieces, not these necessarily, but the ones that are no longer square or rectangular, ones like Gravity and Grace and Amemo in particular that are in the gallery upstairs. I wondered how you felt, what you felt the relationship was to cloth. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Textiles are what produces cloth. You know, has been a, a process that uh, I didn't quite get attracted to, you know, throughout my life. You know, my in, 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 in my in my family and all in, in fact in my hometown, you know, everybody was weaving. And uh, it didn't attract me, you know. And I went to art school where it produced to all the did. area. You say it did or it didn't attract you? Yeah. It did or it didn't attract you? No. Did not? No. Okay. Yeah. And in art school, when it produced to all the areas, including textile, and that was the area that I just det detested completely. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. But, you know, I mentioned that I took. You know, my uh, career uh, you know, spring from, from, from a body of, of, uh, of ideograms and signs. These are printed on textiles. So it's not a textile that attracted me, it's the, the, the stuff on them, the content of, of, of the textile in that instance, you know, the meaning of, you know, and so uh, I uh, kind of regard myself as a sculptor and what I was doing initially was sculpture but then the colors came in. The colors suddenly weren't things that I had decision about. Any number of bottle caps you collected in my environment just happened to have the the color scheme, or yeah, the color scheme of the or the color palette of of, of the kente cloth. You know, the reds, the yellows, the blacks, and you know, they were there all the time. You know, and I didn't know how I could have uh, avoided it because initially I was working as a sculptor, and then I, I wasn't concerned with the colors, and I was just mixing everything up, and so they were looking like kente. No matter what you do, you look like Kente. <laughs> kente, it's not that I, I detest Kente. Kente is an iconic, it's an iconic uh, uh, art form, you know, which I don't think as an artist you want to uh, reproduce. It's already big. It doesn't need you to make it bigger. You know? So I was uh, different. You know, and uh, that different thing happened to uh, align itself. You know, because of the decision that the uh, drink makers made with the colors on their bottle caps. You know, related to you know, and uh, uh, what is that purpose? <laughs> Actually, a, a, a comment. I'm, I'm not even sure you have noticed this so much, um, but African textiles are made in bands. The kente is made in bands, and the bands are sewn together. And the cloth, the proper direction of the cloth, always has the bands running horizontally, always. 
They're printed, they're published in books sometimes sideways, but the bands should run horizontally. And it strikes me, I don't even know to what extent you think about this and how, to what extent it's just automatic. Your bands run horizontally. Whether the thing, whether the piece, oh, yeah, pretty yeah, much, yeah. whether you're using plane, it's mm -hmm. running horizontally, pretty mm -hmm. much. If you turn it, it's for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there's a kind of really um, <coughs> deep sensibility about what feels right um, about that horizontal matrix that you get in some of the pieces. Yeah, I think he has a sculptor again, and by the, the only way that the stuff can be structurally strong is when they run this way, you know, <laughs> not, not also, run this way. Yeah. Also, they produce big billows. You can make very big creases when they run that way because yeah. they have a kind of uh, stiffness. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the other aspect that I remember you ask that the, the, the shapes of my... Yes, now that you have left, you've pretty, you've pretty much recently departed from the rectangular from, from the rectangular format, format. Yeah, that's yeah. like a sheet, uh, like a cloth. Yeah, I want to re-emphasize my sculpture interest, you know, in so the form would have no top, no bottom, no side, <laughs> no left, no right, you know, just mm -hmm. free. And I've just developed uh, uh, formats, uh, structures that make it possible for you to turn them in any direction and they would still be viable, you know. Even, even by the way, front to back. I've seen yeah, and also, and that also, I and also I want to make the, make the two sides all viable so that it could occasionally change, you know, the other side and have something uh, that makes some meaning. But you've also said that it's the fluidity um, and flexibility of the cloth that attracted you. Um, as you look at what the fluidity of the cloth has turned into, your cloth, your pieces, your hangings, have turned into in this exhibition, um, would you like to comment on that, that sense of malleability? Yeah, I think... Uh, For instance, these two pieces, look at right right these two pieces, red, red block and black block. Um, oh, okay. No, no, those are the ones I want to talk about. Well, uh, red, red block and black block, they are about power blocks, and and uh, well, I saw this, and I think they did a, an effective uh, job with the installing, you know, because you could see a lot of pent up force, you know, in in, in the, this thing. In, in in other venues, I think they were more of beautiful objects, but here they were kind of uh, symbolically strong in you know, objects. And uh, the other one I want to talk about is the gravity and grace, mm -hmm. in which uh, I think they were trying to visually interpret the work, you know, by, uh, with, with, the, with the mounting, by making the, is it a gravity side? Is, is down on the floor, flat. Flat, yes. and then yes. on the floor, and then the grace side was uh, wrinkled. Exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, which I think is uh, another interesting uh, way that I have watched that work uh, get exhibited in different uh, venues. There have been venues that it was not on the horizontal, but on the vertical, where you had the grace out and then gravity was done, you know. Which, um, which is grace and which is gravity? Which color? The, the colors, what are you, the colors, to the, 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 the lighter colors, the, the light, the white, white side, and then the, the red side is gravity. So thinking thinking about that piece, and I do hope an image comes up soon and we can see it again. Um, you know, gravity and grace of, of your works in this show is the work that seems to be show show the direction that you're taking these bottle top 
works in the, in the last few years, where we're seeing a really, really interesting play of color and line beginning to emerge in the way that you're treating these as a composition. Can you talk a little bit about how you've sort of reached that point in the work where you're sort of developing these uh, as, as almost sort of painterly compositions? Yeah, I've been collecting bottle caps for many years. I have huge, huge piles of it, so I can afford the luxury of, <laughs> of saying, okay, I want to do something, and I want this color alone, and I'll be able to have the whole set for it and get it. You know, and <laughs> it's like a painter. You have all the colors, and all the palettes there, and now I have all the palettes there, and so I can uh, uh, decide what to do with them. I can decide to restrict a work to one particular color signature and, and do it without uh, any problems. Now, you know, uh, Still with the same materials, they're exactly the same materials that are producing that, that are producing these colors. It's a matter of sorting them by brand, basically. Um, that allows you can get pink if you pull out the white caps that have uh, the red caps that have white printing on them, for example, um, and so forth. And, and that's really an interesting thing that I see you're, you've started to do. Whereas here, the red areas probably include some caps that had some white on them. Um, but they're mixed in so you don't get that shading. It's, it's fascinating to me what you've begun to do um, with shading and with color. Yeah, I think uh, when I became conscious of the color in the world and started taking on the challenges that painters also take, I saw that there was a time that I did a series of uh, Joinings and then they look very transparent. So it reminded me of watercolor washes, you know, transparent watercolor washes. And uh, that was the piece that I used for concrete. And uh, yeah, the idea of transparency, you see through it. And, uh, so I have developed uh, several uh, uh, kind of uh, techniques which would easily. Uh, pass for what a painter would do with the facility of the brush and all those things. But it's different from, from the canvas. In, in today's times, there's a wonderful long article that many of you I'm sure have seen. Um, at the end of the article, uh, you say that you want to go to a new kind of buoyancy. And I've seen the work move from a kind of opaque, opaque solid bottle top to the more transparent form that you're describing that is in bleed, that's kind of like an open work net or veil. Um, what, what will buoyancy, where will buoyancy take you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as artists, you, you have the freedom to uh, let your imagination travel anywhere, you know. I don't know where the warranty will take me and I don't worry about it. <laughs> well, it's interesting, about three years ago, when we interviewed you in Mitsuka, you said, no, maybe even before that, maybe in Venice, you said you were moving towards something ethereal and pure. And that was before you had made Dewey. And I think the, that transparent, um, kind of veil-like space was ethereal and pure. And so buoyancy, we'll see where buoyancy goes. So it's already started. <laughs> it started, I think so. We should have to about five minutes and give it to you. Thanks for questions. Five minutes. You had, a, you had questions with the other one, or shall I? You know, um, you, you have always written poetry, and your titles are often poetic. No, not always. There was, there was a time that I was very poetic. And there was a time, there was a time when he was uh, considered a career in music. Um, he was a member in a band 
this goes back to secondary school and early college. Um, and 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 considered a career in music. So where in your work today does poetry, language, verbal side of things, and music, where does music come in? Because I know you listen to all kinds of music, all kinds of music. Yeah, maybe I wouldn't know where music is in, but I can talk about language and the way I kind of relate to it. Initially, my signs were from language sources, and uh, also, uh, you know, my language everywhere is, you know, my, 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 my native language, which is everywhere, is, is, they have a, a habit of writing. It's a highly tonal language, but then they would write it without tone marking. You know, so that it leaves a lot of freedom. Or, or well, it leaves freedom, or yeah, it leaves a lot of freedom of interpretation. You have to be able to contextualize it in order to get what it means. You know, because the same word spelled same way, no tone marking could mean so many things. You know, if you take glee, for instance, glee, which is war, glee. Disrupt. Uh, glee, that's a story. You know, the, the spelling is the same, you know, and there's so many words. And, uh, you know, having worked with uh, forms that are not fixed and forms that are free, forms that have elastic meaning, I thought that uh, most of the time I want to title my uh, works in my language so that it, first of all, distances it from people. Because very few people who still speak my language, so you don't have to, to be misled by any meaning. <laughs> or even if you understand the language, you don't know what precisely it means, you know. So you left to, to rack your mind or your brain until you find whatever, or don't find anything in it. I mean, and then this, this idea of having these very complex sort of abstract concepts that animate your work is, is something that I think we see running throughout your career. Um, and your career occurred in tandem with serving as a professor at the University of Nigeria in Nsuka for 35 years as a professor of sculpture at the Department of Fine Arts. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how being a teacher influenced, if, if it did, if it influenced your work in any way. Well, maybe if it influenced my work in the sense that, uh, well, it enabled me to pay my bills. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, and therefore, it put pressure on, on my studio practice, you know. My studio practice was free to develop on its own, and you know, it gives you such, uh, I mean, courage or, yeah, courage to experiment. Yeah, experiment without bothering about the, the consequences, you know. And I want to say, uh, most of the works that I've done with uh, began to be collector's items. When I first did them, I wasn't sure whether they were artworks or not. You know, when I did it, I worked with the trays. I worked with them for quite some period before I showed them for the first time. I worked with the wood slabs. I stayed with them for some years before showing them. I think I started in 1980. Yeah, about four years before I showed them for the first time, you know. And the bottle caps who were there in the studio for about 99, yeah, three years, yeah, before I had the courage to show them, you know. For me, they were just experiments and, uh, and all three of them, when they were shown for the first time, 
uh, attracted so much attention, you know, and they reached out to so many uh, people easily. <clears throat> but I wasn't doing them to sell. That's, I, I should say, it's unusual really how many African artists that I know have been forced to make work that sells, which means something that's typically African. Um, and many African artists that I know actually work in two styles. One style to, to you know, pay the bills, and the other style is their own, but it ta that takes a lot of time and effort and sort of juices away from the serious work. So I think that's, I think that's really been terribly important. Really, really, really important. Plus, L, the, the intellectual environment and the inspiration of uh, the African art world that, that had a really important center in Nsuka for at least 10 years, yeah. a crucial 10 years of yeah. year. Yeah. I think that was really important. The African art world that we don't think about existing, but that was hugely supportive and inspiring, I think, for you, wasn't it? Yeah, at the time I went to Nsuka, to Nsuka that was a few years after the war, and the war had uh, kind of made that place a very concent uh, yeah, concentrated with the best uh, brands in almost all the fields that you could uh, think about, you know. And faculty was very high caliber at that time, you know. And, uh, I uh, remember that, uh, yeah, there were people I had read about and or heard about and I was seeing them there in, in, in you know, in uh, full color, <laughs> so to say. <laughs> yeah, and that was a, a great inspiration. You know, I wanted to do about three years, six years, maybe two times, you know, the, the term of three years, and that term of three years there, but as time went on, I saw that there was a place to to stay and grow, you know. And uh, so the, the atmosphere, the, the, the faculty and time students to, you know, were very contributory to my uh, decision to stay there and also consequent growth. Actually, as a, perhaps as a final question, one of the questions I'm asked all the time is why have you stayed in Nsuka now that you are retired, um, now that you can live any place you want, you want to live in Nsuka. And I think it's interesting to, to hear why you chose to stay there. Mostly, well, simple, mostly I mean, he's here It's now. simple, that's where my studio is. And, uh, that's where my studio is. <laughs> and so I have to stay there. I have plans to maybe develop studios in other places, in Ghana, maybe elsewhere. So, because each place that uh, you go to would offer new incentives, new ideas, new media, you know. When you talk about the studio in Nsuka, maybe just describe for a minute what it is today, what the studio in Nsuka is today, what do you mean by studio? Nice. Yeah, the, the, the studio, well, I think the most important aspect of it is that about uh, 20, 30 people that are voluntarily working with me. And uh, I think they like what they do <laughs> so much that on occasions I'm traveling and I say, okay, let's close down. When I come out, they say, no, we work. <laughs> Well, these are young, young chaps from around, living around the studio who uh, mostly have finished high school. And uh, in Nigeria, it's difficult to, you know, take the entrance exam to the university. Because uh, the spaces are very few, the places are few in the universities. And, and uh, compared to the number of uh, people they graduate out of high school, <coughs> every uh, year, you know, so they could spend three, four years trying to take the exam. So whilst waiting, you know, this provides them with uh, something to do, you know, and, uh, you know, 
keep trying their luck, you know. And of late, I've developed it into a, a, a tradition that if, well, just to encourage them to work harder in order to move on in life, that if they pass and go to the university, they will take care of their fees for some time, you know. Perhaps we should just give a few moments um, for questions from the audience. Could you please describe your literal process? Where do you get the bottle caps from? How are your works of art made? Are they done by the young people you were just describing? Could you tell us about that? Actually, the, I think the answer to those questions is available in the gallery pretty easily. And there's a film in the gallery that shows the process itself shows him buying the, the caps and, and how they're put together. Thank you so much for this wonderful program. I, um, I was wondering about if you do any kind of research by visiting a place uh, that you've done installations at the Palazzo Fortuny in Venice or at Palais di Tokyo, and now it's in Bro Broken Bridge and the High Line. It seems like you have a sensitivity to the texture of those buildings and those places. She's, uh, she's asking if you do research before you do the site-specific installations because she says your work has a lot of sensitivity to the textures of the environments. She referred to Broken Bridge in particular. Yeah, yeah, certainly if you are invited to work for a particular uh, environment or location you have to take certain things into consideration and research kind of into uh, the work on the high line was uh, initially for a museum of fashion in Paris. You know, it was on a museum of fashion and, and in uh, <coughs> thinking about fashion, you know, I thought about several things and that I should use, and one of them was the, the, the mirror. You know, the mirror is a very uh, common accessory to, to anything fashion, and, and that, that's how the mirror can, and also uh, still uh, maybe thinking about this uh, the idea of the link between Africa and Europe. You know, mirror was one of the items that I brought, you know, and I was thinking of something that. Uh, also brings in the environment in which the work is. And the mirror does it very well. This in Paris was uh, able to bring in the Eiffel Tower. You know, you can see it in the, in the work. So the Eiffel Tower across appropriated as part of, of the work. And in, in on the high line to the The Empire State the State Building is also appropriated into that book, so that it is a reflection of of uh, of New York, you know, as a place that is has skyline as its uh, signature. We, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, Thank you. Just one of In terms of how, one of the things I, we're all getting old, and I just wanted to get a sense from you as to the kind of uh, artists that are coming out of your workshop and the kind of uh, uh, breakout moment that you may see in terms of artists in your crew, because it's, it's a factory, it's an incredible phenomenon that you've got there. But what artists are coming for that next generation? from your studio. Um, I, I, I don't hear what I'm saying. Actually, I'd like to make a small comment that the studio really doesn't fun function like a factory, but it functions very much like an artist's workshop, the way Titian's workshop or Van Dyke's workshop worked and many other, or Jeff Koons and many other artists. Um, but the question was whether you see artists coming out of your the crew that are working in the studio um, or maybe among your students. Oh, the people are 
just thinking about the studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The very interesting uh, uh, discovery or other, yeah, about the people working in my studio. Several of them have passed and gone to the university, but guess the courses they go for engineering, computer science, <laughs> medicine, medicine <laughs> law, <laughs> economics, you know, just those areas. It's only of late that one or two of them have gone in to do fine art and one went to do music, yeah. There are two that have gone into a creative area, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, it's very time for one more question. Um, I was lucky to see your show up at Wellesley College and various pieces elsewhere. I'm about to see the show here. And I appreciate very much um, the opportunity to hear you today. It's almost for me as if when you take the detritus, the discarded bottle caps, as if they're magically turned into something so beautiful. And I wondered, was there in the beginning any ideological thinking about making green works Works which are helpful to the environment by taking stuff out of land that would go into landfill and turning it into works that can hang in museums into works of art. Uh, so, is that a is that a was that a, even in your mind when you began to use these materials, or was it purely formal and maybe economic? Thank you. Actually. L buys the materials in what is actually a commodities market, a very small commodities market. It's recycled aluminum that's sold to people who process it and cast it and, and make it into useful things. So it's not actually detritus in, in our sense. It would, it would never have gone into landfills. But it's recycled. It, it's recycled into, it's mostly bought by local manufacturers who make pots, spoons, ut utensils out of it. It's aluminum. So it's a scrap aluminum. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you.